Pete Trotman, welcome again to Talking Pest Management. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good, Dan. And yourself? <laughs> Pretty good, thank you. Pete, let's start with the first one. I think a lot of people will be interested in hearing more about uh, pest pulls uh, developed in the past one year that we didn't catch up and uh, how, especially how COVID hit you. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose COVID's an interesting one, really. Uh, and although, you know, there's been a lot of tragedy out there in the world with COVID, I think uh, for me personally, it's been a very interesting time because it's allowed me to get out in the field more, and I'll talk about that later. Um, but I, I suppose there's been a lot of um, businesses that have had to adapt to remote working, mm-hmm. whereas in Pest Pulse, because, you know, our developers uh, work abroad, we've got people in Brazil, in in Germany, in Dublin, in Portugal, uh, in Ireland, everywhere. We um, are used to working remotely. I I suppose for us, it's been a bit of um, BAU. and We work remotely with our supply partners and our self-delivery. So for us, it it hasn't been that much of a dynamic change um, in regards to COVID. Mm -hmm. And, uh, And I think that shows that the benefit of if you do are able to work remotely in times of adversity. You don't have to adapt quite so much. Yeah, true. I mean, how could you ever get the staff that you are having, developers from Brazil, etc. you mentioned, um, with uh, yeah, having a, a fixed office in Dublin that everybody needs to visit every day? Yeah, totally sure. agree. So did you um, have um, doubts that pest control would be deemed to uh, being a key service in the beginning, or was that clear for you from the very start? Um, I don't know if it was clear because I didn't really understand the, uh, the, uh, our government's priorities at that particular stage, but I thought it would be one of the first services that people mm. would demand uh, become an essential service and we could gain the classification of key workers. Mm. So I, I, glad, I was glad to see that came in fairly early in the process after the initial lockdown. Um, yeah, so that, that helped our clients and us for sure. Yeah. So can you um, help us with a little bit of a recap the last 12 months, uh, I think now second and a half year or something for Pest Pulse. Uh, so what happened? What's new with you guys? Well, well I suppose, you know, it's, it's, we've been developing our, our processes and our supply and our implementation of, of smart technology. And I think that sort of falls into two, two elements, really. Yes, we're developing more smart devices. Um, we have a, a new batch coming in now, one and a half thousand units at the end of uh, this month. Mm-hmm. So we've got a, a broader range of smart units and we're getting a higher quantity. And, and that gives us more data as we put those out into the field. So I think, I think that's one good thing. But I think we're also learning how to start to use those in an IPM program. Whereas before, you know, we were very much, we knew smart worked, we knew how to put it in, in the corner X, Y, and Z or in the roof mm-hmm. forward. We knew how to connect that signal up and we knew we got an alert or a bit of information. Mm-hmm. But, but those were lots of different parts of the puzzle, really. And it's really fitting those together and gaining um, intelligence and information on that. And then how to apply that to gain a cost advantage, how to apply that to reduce client risk. So that cost advantage and that reduction of client risk, I think, is something that we've been focusing on both in regards to development in our, our, our portals, the clients can see that, in regards of communication with the clients, uh, mm. automated communication and updated reports, mm. and working with the, the guys in the field so, so they understand really how that piece of intelligence becomes part of their control program. Mm-hmm. Data is the new gold, a that uh, a lot of people always uh, claim is it the same for you? Do you see the same pest control? I mean, speaking about people the first time about digital devices, smart, um, people are oftentimes wondering whether we cannot forecast rodent situations, etc. So things that sound today still very fancy, um, albeit we already had a couple of years of smart. So what are your thoughts on, on data and what does it do at pest poles? Mm. Yeah predictive uh, using data to predict activities is, is, is a very interesting one and I think as an industry we're some time away from that to make any real sense of that um, we certainly do see um, trends in areas we certainly do see trends in seasonality with the data 
Um, but I don't think that's telling us anything more than we pretty much knew um, as, as pest controllers. <coughs> that we're going to need more of that on a more extensive basis to, to get to that. But will we? Absolutely. I, I, I think we will get to that. Um, and I think it's interesting in areas where we work intensively, like, like Soho in London, where we are finding that there are peaks in activity around um, uh, communal areas, yeah, in, in, in around zones. So um, some way away from that, yes, making real use of that. But it's interesting to watch it and see how that develops. Agreed. So one thing you told me earlier before we started to record the interview, you said you've been um, in the field lately a lot. So um, can you tell us um, how, how that uh, um, change appeared to happen and how, what did you see? Sure. Okay. So, so what, one of my certain passions is, is to work out there with technicians and by myself in the field. And I think COVID was very interesting because it allowed you to go into premises where you could focus on, on rodent control, focus on pest control without any real disturbance of, of, of clients and people, uh, clients and customers because the places were empty. Yeah. So you, you had this um, clear train of thought when you were in there without any distractions. And throughout the COVID period, although there was a couple of weeks of, of, of um, really, you know, the customers shutting up shop completely to begin with, as we worked with our clients and they opened those sites up for us to, to get in, I was spending about three, sometimes four days a week in London going around multiple premises. Um, observing what was happening, you know, what benefit did, did Smart give, what sites uh, that just had standard traps in and baits, how did that compare? So I, th I think the key observations were, were interesting around rodent behaviour. Um, things like uh, mice. Now, we use lots of run-through traps for mice. Yeah. So, and we know with double run through traps, uh, it was more commonplace for a mouse to be caught on the second trap from the entrance. Mm -hmm. And that means that they're running there at speed, jumping over the first one, landing in the second one. Yeah, and that, that was more commonplace than landing on the first one. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, about halfway through COVID, uh, after about four weeks, we found that they were being caught on the first trap. Oh, really? Yeah, and so it's more commonplace being caught on the first trap. Now, what did that tell you? <clears throat> is that actually, because there were so many humans going about, the mice were starting to go slow. Yeah, so, yeah, so they were they, they were they were going towards these traps, um, and they were entering them not in a scurrying motion. Yeah, so they were entering them at a slower speed, and also we, we were catching more on what are called baffle traps of so boxes where they had to maneuver through a maze to get to the trap. So they weren't as successful as run throughs, but we were catching more on those than we would normally catch. So I think I think the run behaviour changed. It was really interesting. Certainly where baits were used, there's a higher uptake of bait because there's less food competition, which again, we expected that to happen. <clears throat> uh, rats certainly um, increased greatly. We're able to control mice um, quickly. Um, so the level of mouse activity in site significantly reduced and we've probably got the lowest level I think we've ever seen in side premises whereas rats had certainly increased they they would be more aggressive nor on their way through doors getting into buildings nor on their way into bins um, and i think the lack of street food for, for rats yeah. Yeah. they are more dependent yeah. on street food um, uh, made them come into a lot more premises so more rats less mice in some of mm. I think what a lot of people don't know because they don't see it um, is that nights, especially, you know, so you mentioned Soho, like areas like Soho, um, rats live in, in the canals and sewage system, obviously, um, or not all of them, but uh, a lot of them live there. And in the nighttime, they use it as a, as a hub, um, living in, inside the sewage, leaving the sewage, eating out outside in the nighttime when humans are asleep and going back in. Did you, is that something that gotten visible? Is that something that uh, pest controllers, are, um, uh, especially in these uh, downtown areas, are used to? Or is that, is that something you've seen a lot? Um, I don't know if I saw any relationship to sewerage systems change than, than was um, pre-COVID at all. As I say, all I really saw was that there were 
more rats searching a wider range for less food, which made them more aggressive in, in their pattern to gain entry to buildings or yards or bins. The, the amount of um, yeah. um, lids on plastic bins that I've seen chewed through for rats to get mm. in, into. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the Euro bins, the large metal ones with the rubber bungs, the amount of rats that just gnawed straight through to those was was incredible uh, but but i also saw um I, I was at one premise last week and that had a yard area with bins a waste waste yard and that had 13 traps in there a uh, a customer that was concerned about their rat infestation asked me to come in it wasn't the site that we serviced but the other contractor put 13 traps in there which was reasonable quantity and they, they got them in in okay areas but out of those traps, there was um, two rats in those traps. One was probably about three months old and the other about a month old. Um, there were two traps that were set ready to, um, ready to kill. Yeah. And nine other traps had all been knocked by, by rodents. Now, I don't think they'd particularly been knocked by um, humans because there wasn't humans walking around yeah. there. Um, and so I said to the clients, you know, what you've got here is you think you're protected because you've got all these stations and traps around, but um, 83% of your traps are useless. They've either got a rat in yeah. or they've been knocked off, and you don't know about that. And, and I think that's interesting to see that clients think they're protected um, by having boxes about. But unless you get some intelligence for those boxes or you understand whether they're armed or whether there's rodents going through them, they're pretty useless. So um, I think um, uh, in that circumstance, having such a high number of boxes that are ineffective really um, helps uh, the case for remote monitoring. I remember back in the days when we met the first time, we talked about these maze boxes or dome boxes um, where, where my, you know, with the very tight openings. Uh, and you said something like, um, you can probably say, but you, you need to stick to to really convince them to to get in there, right? Yeah, yeah, and you push them in there with a stick, that's right, yeah. yes. So certainly, you know, when you're on site and you can watch mice move and, and, and you put different boxes down, where you have a box with a larger opening allowed to en enter at speed, mm -hmm. um, absolutely, you, you will get more, um, more ingress. Mm -hmm. Where you have um, traps where they haven't got to change the texture of the surface they walk on so much to get into that trap or you put an exposed trap and not a trap in a box, you, you, you know, you will absolutely get uh, higher efficacy on that particular trap. So, um, you disturbing their natural, not disturbing their natural movement is mm -hmm. always key to get great, great efficacy on the traps we find. Yeah. Earlier, we, uh, before that we uh, start to record, you said that um, a crucial element is you cannot replace, everybody talks about smart, smart here and there in digital traps and various different models. And you said um, you cannot replace a regular pest control box, be it bait, trap, or monitoring latent with a smart box. And I think a lot of people um, and past managers around the world that are thinking and heard about smart and, and uh, think about it, and you're executing so much. So can you share a little bit about what is the key? Not just replacing, but, but what do you do and how does it how does it work out for you? Yeah, so I think, you know, about some um, two years ago or so, I said, I think we're on a five year journey with smart. And, uh, you know, here we are in year two where a lot of manufacturers have developed smart technology. Yeah. Um, it's got easier to use. It's got easier to implement. It's got easier to connect to the cloud or however you connect it. There's a greater range. Um, there's much better videos online, how to connect mm. these things. So giving a guy a box of, of smart and getting them into sides and putting those smarts is much easier than it was a couple of years ago. So, so we'll tick that box now. But I think um, the real key about um, getting smart out there more as business as usual is going to be down to two things. One, one the commercial element, and that is um, are smart, is smart more expensive than conventional? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and costs have come down and mm -hmm. time on site to set up a site has come down. Mm 
So those two things now weigh equally with the labour savings. So smart is not more expensive than conventional pest control in most situations. But to reinforce that statement, you really need to understand how to implement smart. And I think Wind's Pest Pulse are still learning the best way to do that. How do we? How many smart devices do we put down in the site to complement um, rather than replace um, conventional means of control? So smart isn't a replacement to pest control. It is a complement to it where we can put smart in really high risk areas. We can put smart in areas that are really difficult to get into. We can put smart in areas where technicians don't want to service. Um, if you look at the distribution tray, if you look at the distribution warehouses, the amount of um, automated picking aisles now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you can only get access to those once every six weeks when there's a maintenance shutdown. Yeah. And you can argue to get into them all the time if you want, but they are not going to shut down for pest control. You know, they're, they're going to say you've got a window three o'clock on a Sunday morning. To get yeah. In. <laughs> um, so, 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 I, so I think the industry, and we're still on a bit of a discovery to say, we think smart's good, but we don't fully understand how to use it yet, both from a technician's perspective when it's on site, or as a business owner on how many and exactly where to put them. Yeah. We know it's good, but we don't know quite how good. Yeah. And, and I think you know the industry bodies like the BPCA and others should really start to play a bit of a, uh, an assisting role in that. Um, because I don't think they dedicate any task force or, 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 or any resource to say, how should smart fit in an IPM and what recommendations are we going to give further than that? So I think that's something, you know, for the next two years that, 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 that will be worth. Have you, um, um, CIPA, uh, European Association, has um, released an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, which has a strong focus on, on IPM. Um, have you guys read it already? About 11 o'clock last night, I read it actually. Yeah, that, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. Well, I thought you'd ask me on this 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 course. I thought I'd best. I'd best <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I did, did my homework slightly. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I, I, I think the, the whole um, element of trying to professionalize what we do, yeah, and gain recognition. I think an important part of the theme of that was gaining recognition yeah. for how professional pest control is, how trained pest control technicians have got to be, yeah, and right. how that should be valued in the marketplace. And, you know, I really think we work with a number of customers, um, uh, pub groups, retail outlets, manufacturing, mm. that really are valuing pest control technician mm. skill sets mm. and we're able therefore to reward technicians better than we were able to do before and, and i think that's really important for us as, as an industry to continue along that those lines and, and and really promote that so i think the CEPA, in regards of its mou in regards of recognition of the professionalism um and steering the industry in the way to go uh, if steering is the right word is is, is is the right right thing to do Fully supportive. Well, super. Yeah, that sounds good. I think it's it's a uh, quite a cool tool to um, show what we are up to, what the value of our services. And I think and this would be my next question: that during COVID, where a lot of um, various businesses and areas filed bankruptcy or have seen how fragile they are, being financed or venture backed so much. Um, have um, I mean, the society is basically um, or it. it it brought it to the surface, which businesses are key or essential. And I think pest control is after the um, manufacturing, um, you know, farm to fork, after the manufacturing of food for humans and pharmaceuticals, I think pest control is somewhere in the chain there delivering some valuable service. So thank you for all the feedback. I, I personally do think it's valuable too. Um, so yeah, my, my next question would be, um, do you think a lot of pest controllers are going to suffer within the next six 12 or 24 months because of what happened? I mean, imagine you have a lot of pubs, restaurants, hotels. Um, do you think only these people or some, some people that have uh, um, some sort of financial mechanisms in place that don't work anymore? What is your take on that? 
Well, it was interesting. I was speaking to a um, city investor yesterday on the phone, which I've done some previous work for. Mm. Um, and they, he was looking at the impact of COVID on the pest control industry. Um, and he has a big portfolio of, of investment. Now, um, I think two things are going to happen. Yes, a lot of the clients are going to suffer. A lot of our clients are going to suffer and are suffering at the moment. So they haven't got the available cash to spend on any activities. Yeah. Uh, I still think from, from what I see, they're still willing to spend it on pest control because they don't have a good choice um, to do that. And therefore, as an industry, we are reasonably robust through times of adversity. But, but what I, th- I think is going to happen is the, the people that are going to win out of that are the ones that can dynamically change at a faster pace, can work more remotely, both in regards of not utilising so much expensive labour to go to site, um, but also can work as a business remotely. So I think those two things are, are, are going to come into play. I think that the labour market where the pest control industry can attract a better level of technician may well help because there, there, there will be more choice in the labour market. And I think maybe um, younger people mm. who are slightly harder to, to attract in our unusual industry, yeah. it's not the basis of, of industries to join when you're young for sure, may look at pest control now as a bit more robust and uh, less boom and bust type industry that they can develop a, a career in. Uh, and I hope that sort of message gets out there. I don't know how to get that out there. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's a really hard one. But but I think certainly it's, uh, there will be a um, better opportunity to train a higher level of professional people. And I hope they start to come from a, a younger generation. And I think it's it's quite um it could be very true. The likes of that becoming true are, in my eyes at least, are pretty high. I just spoke to Generation Z, uh, um, a person in my family yesterday, and uh, they are very aware of what's happening. We talked about startup because he's very business interested, and uh, he said that all of this nature, um, you know. Building up a company in five years, exiting, etc., wasn't really his business, and neither of his friends. And he was looking at something more solid. So uh, maybe, Pete, you're right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so last but not least, um, something that people always ask me in um, in, the, in the topic of smart is what what tools do we use with smart? Do we use trap X, trap Y? Do we use the box latent? Do we use just a motion trigger or whatever? Do we use bait? Do you, what bait do we use? Do, you, do we use non-toxic bait? You know, all these various tools available in combination with smart. And that's what people, I think, um, have an issues with. We see a lot of smart traps, obviously. You know, rent a car is a very clever CO2 solution. Um, Many things exist. So what is your take on these tools? Well, I think you've got to keep it reasonably simple. And we have a great variety of tools. So I think, you know, we we use smart to say, here's a problem. Here's probably the quantity of the problem. And it hones down the area of the problem within a site. So we get that intelligence from smart. And then it's either how is that complemented on a proactive basis? Yeah. So the answer to that is primarily um, non-smart traps um, rather than poisons, especially in, in, in urban centres. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a control measure, once you get that indication of, of rodent movement, then they certainly still have a, a, a part to play. Um, so normally we would go down the lines of to complement smart traps, you put non-smart traps. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going to use rodenticide, contact gels, contact tent are far, far more effective than any edible baits. Um, but there's a skill set in putting those contact gels yeah, down. Absolutely. And, and, and that's great because that challenges the technician to mm. really think about where the rodent is. Whereas if you're going to put down bait, you, know, you sort of know it's going to be in this area and then mm. you put down some bait. But I think the use of contact gel challenges the technician to get down on their hands and knees more, to get underneath units, to investigate into cupboards and to roof voids. 
Um, so we would then, um, you know, usually go to our, our, our tool chest of, of rodent control uh, elements and pick some form of con contact. Uh, and then I suppose the last um, resort there is, is to, to utilize rodenticides. And I'm not anti rodenticide at all, and I'll absolutely use them where, where they're effective. But we, we have to accept that A, there is a higher level of resistance, chemical resistance. B, there is a higher level of behavioral resistance to, cons to consuming um, edible rodenticides. And therefore, um, the, the, the amount of times that you can use these to wholly control um, rodent activity in urban areas is becoming limited now. Yeah. So you do, do you think that, I mean, a lot of people talk about this. Do you think in the next 5, 10, 20 years, we're not seeing any form of rodenticides anymore or anticoagulants? Well, I, legislation will have its part to play in that, and, and that may be different in different parts of the world. But um, I can see um, it being driven by the efficacy of the use of rodenticides. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is one of the ways that we will see less because they, they are less effective. Um, when the legislation comes over um, that and starts to say, listen, world, um, there, there is a truly viable alternative now where we haven't got to use rodenticides, whereas I don't think we could say that 10 years ago as, as an industry or as a business, but um, can, we, can we maintain effective road control without amrodenticides. Personally, I believe with a lot of effort we can today. Um, is that the right thing to do? I think we're still a little bit away from that yet, but I, I think that, that will come at, at some stage. <clears throat> You're probably a bit more in tune with that, Daniel, than I am in regards of the way that um, legislation's going. But, you know, it's obvious to say that today there are less rodenticides that work, um, that, that are less efficient than there were um, Five, ten years ago. Yeah. In the end, um, from so many pest controls around the world, I think the most important um, thing that plays into this is we need tools and we ourselves need to decide as professionals what tools we want to use. So um, I think IPM is something that we talk about since the 90s, since it, it brought into existence. I just had an interview with Bobby Corrigan and uh, Bobby's the IPM guy. Um, being based in New York, obviously, and with, with rats and harborages and, and the sewage mm -hmm. system there. And I think what um, we really uh, didn't do, if, if everybody, uh, you know, um, uh, examines themselves, basically, if they did a proper, proper, proper IPM before actually applying any sort of biological, physical or chemical control, uh, we might have worked at 70, 80% IPM, whereas we could have maybe reached 100. And what I found really interesting is that in Holland, which is always a funny, uh, innovative country that I like to interview people from, in Holland, um, they changed the law um, a little bit and the guidelines they have towards to not being able to lay down a rodenticide, for instance, when IPM has not yet been brought forward at 100%. And then um, there has been a case study from um, one of the uh, one of uh, the larger companies there, and they have um, uh, worked on farms especially. And I mean, you and I know when there is a problem, uh, a farm is uh, definitely a bigger one um, mm -hmm. than maybe a supermarket or a warehouse. So most of the times, at least. So they they ask the farmers to actually put up walls to uh, increase the building structure, and the farmers said, "Look, it's too expensive. We won't do." It. And then they just simply answered, "Okay, we cannot by law then apply any form of proactive or active pest control measurements." And it, it went front and back, but with the law behind them, the farmers then, after a while of discussion, um, you know, went back and installed a new wall or such. And um, I think that would be a great help for pest controllers to put a little bit of uh, a responsibility on the side of uh, the clients as well, because we all would probably agree if our clients spent um, a little bit more budget on keeping their sites uh, hygiene uh, very high and their building structure very high, that the control we do, pest management, um, is now called pest control most of the times, will be decreased. Do you agree? 
Yeah, I think RPM has always been with us, you know, before the word IPM was invented. Um, it, yeah. it's, it's always been a program where, where you bring in proof in hygiene and control practices. Um, I, I think um, I think that's a great example in the way that Holland have done it. If they have said, you know, listen, you absolutely got to make sure you've done everything and, and rodenticide should be a last resort rather than your mm. first resort because it's, it's sort of cheap and semi-effective. Mm. Um, that, that would be a, a great way to go. But I think even without legislation, I think some um, clients have gone down that line. I've got a great example of one of our, our commercial contracts that we took on in January. They were having almost 2,000 routines to uh, their sites. Um, basically, they were going down the policy of the more rodents they had on a site, the more routines would be done by the pest controller, and that's the right thing to do. Yeah. So it's, and, and they were almost accepting that many sites were having continued levels of activity. So we went in there with a different approach. We said, let's, let's use some intelligence, yeah. let's get some facts, and let's see really what's happening to your estate. Yeah. Now, cut a long story short, we've taken those um, routines down from 2,000 to their estate down to just over 1,000 in less than four months. We've taken their infestation levels down from just about 40% down to less than 6%. So, oh, wow. so, so you've got this situation where um, a client was being advised just to do more, more, more of the same, which wasn't working, and increase the costs. And um, you, you could just imagine that 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 the cost savings of those thousand routines in regards of transport and, and everything this. They haven't spent less. In fact, they spent a little bit more, but they've spent it on proofing and proactive measures. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and they've seen that the, the, they've gone to the marketplace, found something that's slightly different, taken a different approach, used data, used intelligence, used facts to, to go and look at their sites. And now they're just amazed because they didn't think this was actually possible. Um, within four months, they're in the best situation that, that they've ever been in. So I think I think if, if it's approached the right way and you do have to get the right client, you can get them on board to actually support that regardless of legislation. Um, but certainly legislation would help to those clients that maybe need a bit more of a nudge down the IPM route. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Hey, super Pete, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, um, you know, being uh, such a pioneer in, in digital and smart and, and everything that you do. And uh, yeah, all the best to Pest Poles and uh, you managing the company. Uh, and I would love to revisit that again in the next six to 12 months. So see you soon. Sure, that's great. All the best. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.